Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Garrett, and I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. And, um, wow, this is a big meeting. It's a big room. Far bigger than I was led to believe when I first I was sort of accepted this job. But this evening, um, I come to, to come to you, uh, brothers and sisters, as a, a drunk. As a drunk, a recovering drunk. And I don't want anybody to think, or I'd hate people to get the idea that I'm up here spouting some sort of special knowledge or that I have some sort of special message that I'm going to sort of mysteriously kind of zoom in on you all with. I haven't. I haven't. All I have is my story. I'm standing at a podium. I'm not on top of it. I'm Please don't think I'm preaching from it. This is just my story. For the newcomers, if you can identify a little bit with the story, hang on to that bit. Hang on to whatever sounds familiar to you. And you can say, well, yeah, maybe maybe I did that a little bit. Or maybe I kind of, that's a bit of me in there. You know, because you're not going to, you're not going to identify with my whole story. Okay? But the bits that you do, please hang on to, because they're the bits that will bring you back. And they're the bits that people can explain to you about what's happening, people that are in the program a, 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 long, a longer time than I am. Um, so I'll start off anyway. Um, as you can probably hear, I don't speak the same as you guys. Uh, we, we use proper English where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll speak a little bit slower, um, so that you can, so that you can, you can, you can understand actually what I'm saying. Um, I also have my bottle here, and that normally kind of means if I take a drink out of the bottle, that normally means that I'm going to cry, or I'm trying not to cry, because this thing actually is quite um, draining. Doing um, being, the, being asked. And the privilege of doing a speaker meeting is actually quite emotional. It's, it, it's quite an emotional thing uh, because I'm talking about me and the things that matter to me and AA matters to me. That's the bottom line. So I started off as a, I was born and bred to an Irish family, obviously. Um, my parents never drank. My brothers and sisters don't drink. I took up the mantle. So I, I, I don't want anybody to think that I came from any sort of deprived background. I didn't. I had a very ordinary background. I went to school. I was happy enough in school. didn't study, but I was happy in school. Um, and um, alcohol wasn't part of our lives. It wasn't part of our lives at all, um, which, which kind of is unusual because when I went to, the, to my treatment center, it took me about two weeks to convince them that we had no alcoholics in the family because, you know, they, they, they kept saying, there must be one somewhere. And I kept saying, no, and, and, and that is the gospel truth. There isn't. And um, why I'm an alcoholic, I don't know. And neither do I care. I don't care I'm an alcoholic. What I do care about is how I act as a recovering alcoholic. That is key. There is no point being a dry, as far as I'm concerned, being a dry drunk. You might as well be back at your bar stool, sitting up, having your drink, go and enjoy it. Because otherwise you'll just be a miserable SOB and nobody will want to know you anyway. And that is the gift of AA. It teaches us the tools. It teaches us the methods. It teaches us the process of how to stop drinking initially. And then second of all, how to live a fruitful and purposeful life. A life that is happy, that is content, that is worth something, and that we can share with others. That is what I believe the message of AA is. So as I said, I grew up in a regular normal family. 
And um, one day, when I was about 17 years of age, a guy came into the classroom, and he was looking for recruits for um, a religious order. And he was given this talk about the religious order, and um, he said, would anybody be interested in joining? And it was a Catholic school, obviously, and nobody put up their hand, and I felt very sorry for him. I, I just... <laughs> you know, it was, it was the furthest thing from my mind at the time, but I put up my hand anyway just to make him... Kids, just so that he wasn't wasting his time. So lo and behold, I actually joined a religious order and I lived as a monk for 10 years. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, I know it's a, I told you no to identify with me, a lot of my story. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say there's too many people in here that have lived as a monk for 10 years. Um, but that's, that's what I did. That's what I did. And I hope I don't upset people's, um, uh, um, you know, uh, view of religion or the Catholic Church. I'm not trying to do that whatsoever. But it is also for those 10 years. I joined when I was 17. I left when I was 28. It was also where I learned how to drink. <laughs> believe it or believe it not, that is the fact. Now, I hope I'm not uh, insulting anybody's sensibilities here. I am not trying that at all. This is just my story. Um <laughs> Because there was a drinking culture within the religious order. And we were expected as young people to buy into this drinking um, sort of policy. And, <laughs> um, and, and and that's what it was. Like we, we used to get up at God on early hours in the morning, half four, to say prayers and do all this sort of stuff and go to Mass and then go to school and come back. But come Friday, um, it was kind of party time. And um, we used to have this thing. It was this size. And it was called a monk's measure. So when you were pouring somebody out of whiskey, that was the height of the amount of whiskey that they got in the glass. Right? That was called a, mo a monk's measure. It went from your thumb to your little finger. And that's what you poured out for everybody. And... Then a little drop of water went into it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the, the cry always was, oh, don't drown us, don't drown us. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so, but we were expected to drink at 18 and 19 years of age just as much as men who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, who were hardened drinker. And it is where I like to call it, I served my apprenticeship with drink. And that's really where I learned how to do, how to drink. It's also where I learned how to hide the effects of drink. And I also learned how to hide the, I, I, I liked the kind of secrecy of it. I liked the way it made me feel. It made me feel suddenly very important. It took away my shyness. And um, it, it gave me sort of a way of acting that was kind of cool. You know, it was kind of, um, you know, I, I was growing up now. I'd, I'd arrived. I'd matured. I was a man. And this is what men did. They drank whiskey out of tumblers with, a drop of water, and you drank, and you drank as many of them as you could, and you never were to appear drunk. To appear drunk would be a scandal. And that just wouldn't be allowed. So that's that 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 that's where drink brought me, and I did that for many years. I did that until about when I was twenty-eight. It was either join full time for the rest of my life, or leave. So I decided um, to leave. Uh, I left, but it left an indelible imprint on me. Those 10 years left an imprint on me regarding alcohol. There's absolutely no doubt about that in my mind whatsoever. I again, I'll recap, I'll say the secrecy about it, the way it made me feel, the excitement that I felt when I kind of first got that glass in my hand and took the first sip, 
um, and the the sense of camaraderie. I loved the camaraderie of alcoholism. I loved being with alcoholics who were who were active alcoholics. I don't know whether that's common among uh, people sitting here tonight, <laughs> but I I certainly enjoyed being with other alcoholics who are drinking alcoholically. I had no time, absolutely none, for these social drinkers. <laughs> they used to annoy me so much. Um, Christmas time would come, you know, and I'd be in the corner of the bar on my stool with my newspaper, with my glass with my name on it, and my barman. But my barman might be busy with these silly social drinkers um, that couldn't, ha- that could only have two or three drinks, and then they were falling all over the place, and they were wobbly, and they were, I, well, go away from me, get away. They weren't. They, I didn't want to mix with people like that. I wanted to be there on the Monday when the pub opened. And, you know, I'm in the trenches with these guys. They couldn't do without me. I was the pillar of the pub. I was, I was holding the whole thing, the whole show together. Without me, it just couldn't go on. And, and that's, that's what alcohol brought me to. It brought me to a stage where I really thought a bar or a pub, as we call it in Ireland, wouldn't be able to get on without me. Um, that was it. Like I, I used to love this thing. Um, do you remember this program? It was called Cheers, and um, you know I used to love this thing when Norm would open the door and walk in. Everybody would say hi, Norm. Well, that's I love that. It was the same when I walked in the door. It was hi, Garrett. The usual yes, please. And that gave me a tremendous sense of oh, I'm important. I'm big, I'm mature, I'm an adult now, and this is the way adults behave. So life went on in, 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 in that way, and my drinking didn't really interfere that much with any other life. I was working, I, was, I, I got married, we had a son, and um, everything was going fairly well, but I was still drinking quite a lot, and I was drinking secretly. I used to, for instance, just go into a little bit of a drunk alug. I would leave the office at half two on a Friday. It would be about an hour's commute home. I used to commute, commute to the local pub, which was about 50 yards away from the house. <laughs> I'd, I'd park the car around the back of the bar. Um, it would be maybe 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd ring my wife from the bar, and I'd say, Look, honey, I'm running late. I won't be home until about 7 o'clock. I was about 50 yards away from the house. (laughs) That's how secretive... They they say that it's cunning, baffling, and powerful. I am the absolute walking, talking, human version of that. Alcohol, as I said this morning in another meeting, it turned me into a liar, it turned me into a cheat, and it turned me into a fraud. And I, it became so bad, I began to believe my own lies. As alcohol slowly wrapped its tentacles around me, um, I began to really believe this false world that I created. Things came to a head in July 2001. Don't worry, I'm not going to cry, I'm just thirsty. <laughs> Things came to a head in July 2001 um, for me in that I went off. um, My wife decided to go with our new, he was nine months old at the time, our new baby. She decided she'd go home and visit her parents, which I was delighted with because I now had the weekend free. So, of course, the only thing on my agenda to do was to drink. Um, so I rang a friend of mine and I said, look, come on, we go down to the local bar and we have a few pints, and as we call it in Ireland. And um, so we went down there and we found out that there was a local soccer match in the next village. Um, so we said, well, why not go down there? It was a beautiful summer's evening. Why not go down there for a few beers as well? So we went down there for a few beers and um, then it was getting a bit late. It was getting near nine o'clock and we would no way home. We had 
Now, we were very responsible. We left the cars at home because we wouldn't drink and drive. Um, and we were standing outside this pub wondering, in the middle of nowhere, if you know Ireland, it's very rural, uh, and we were wondering how the hell we were going to walk the five or six miles back to where we'd come from. And the next thing is a car pulled up in front of us, and clear God, it was a neighbour of ours. And he said, do you want a lift? Or a ride, as you say over here. Um, in, in, in Ireland, that is a completely different connotation. But in... in, in, in uh, <coughs> but I, I, I'll use the American kind of thing, since I'm in America. Would you like a ride home? So, um, not when you get home or, you know, but would you like... <laughs> so, um, anyway, we got into this car. And my friend got in the front, and I got in the, the back seat. And five minutes later, we'd killed three people. We killed a 14-year-old girl and her father in one car, and the friend that I got into the car with, he was killed instantly too. What we didn't know was the guy who was driving the car had been drinking what we call putching which is moonshine. He had been drinking it all day. And we didn't know that. And he sped off down the road. Now, this is all stuff that I've been told. I don't rem remember any of this. He sped off down the road, lost control of the car. I got shot out through the back window of the car, landed on the far side of the road. The car that I was in hit a ditch. That killed my pal. And then it bounced into oncoming traffic, where the 14-year-old girl and her father died instantly as well. Just to add insult to injury, the car that I had been in spun up in the air, and of all the funny places it decided to land, it landed directly on top of me, of me lying unconscious on the side of the road. Um, yeah, it was about as awful as you can imagine. Um, I was in a coma for three months. They didn't know whether I was going to live or die. I did had huge amount of injuries done to me. I'm still getting next September. I have to go back in because I had to rebuild my leg again. Um, I've been in a hospital for 10 years, but I'm here. Those poor people who died, those innocent people, they aren't here. And that was all down to alcohol. That incident was all down to alcohol. At the time, could I see that it was down to alcohol? <laughs> Absolutely not. I can remember being in intensive care, and I had tubes coming out from here. I was on a ventilator. I was on everything. I was, they, were, they were convinced I was going to die. And I remember having this thought, as clearly as I'm talking to you here, um, God, I hope they don't tell me I won't be able to drink again. <laughs> that was the one, that was the biggest, like, yeah, like my leg was shattered. I had, I couldn't, I couldn't open my eyes. I couldn't, I couldn't communicate. I was on a life support machine. Everybody was expecting me to die. Yet the biggest thing in my mind was, would I be able to drink again? Would a doctor come in and say those awful words, you're too sick, you'll never be able to drink again. So, jeez, you know, um, it was extraordinary. It just shows you again, cunning, baffling, powerful. This disease that we battle on a daily basis, we only have a daily reprieve from it. That's all we have. I don't want I, I don't want anyone to think that say any newcomer that next week something's going to happen or next month something's going to happen to make things better. Forget it. This thing is a twenty four hour program, and that's how it worked for me. Unfortunately, now you would imagine after all that I couldn't remember my childhood. I didn't remember my wife. I couldn't talk. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't eat. I couldn't walk. You would imagine that the penny would have dropped that alcohol had something to do with this. No. Not at all. I went straight back down to the pub. 
I can remember when I got home, I set myself, my uh, physiotherapist said, set yourself a goal. <laughs> I said, I'm way ahead of you. I'm way ahead of you. You know, I was I was about six months in hospital at this stage. And I said, set a goal. I said, I've been setting a goal since day one. And my goal was to go in my wheelchair down to the local bar and get a hero's welcome. And that's exactly what happened. When I got out of the hospital in a wheelchair, I managed to wheel myself down the road to the bar, opened the door, and I was welcomed like a hero. Instead of being welcomed like a drunk who had been part of an incident that had killed three people. So, it's incredible to think that I, I, like, I'm a reasonably intelligent guy. I went to college. I got a degree. I, you know, I, I was working in high, in business and high end of business at the time. And yet, I, I was completely blinded to the fact that this incident I'd been involved in, this accident was alcohol related. I could not see it. The blinkers were still on. I could not see this had anything to do with alcohol. So I just kept drinking. Now this is where my drinking kind of sped up because people began to buy me drink. You know, if somebody goes into a pub in a wheelchair and he's, you know, he's, he's kind of there and he's droopy and he's, you know, you know and, and the counter's up here, uh, you know, They'll say, do you want a pint? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And even though I couldn't lift it up, I drank a pint out of a straw. That's what I did. That's how addiction got me. That's how the power of alcohol got me. So in my recovery, in my physical recovery, it became obvious I wasn't going to go back to work. But alcohol became more and more part of my life. When my wife went out, I drink at home. When she came back, I drink in the pub. Um, you know, and I became a home parent. So our son went off to school. My wife is a school teacher. She'd go to school, and I'd have the whole day to fill in. And I used to fill it in in perfect little sections. I would not drink before 12 o'clock because you were an alcoholic if you drank before 12 o'clock. <laughs> but I would be in the pub at a minute past noon getting my alcohol. At two o'clock I would leave the pub to go to the school gate to pick up our son from school and be the upright, up like I was a pillar of the community. You know, but I was drunk. I was a drunk pillar of the community. I was the only person standing at the school gate with maybe six pints of cider and you know half a bottle of brandy inside in them at the time. But again, because of the training that I had got and the stamp that was left on me in the religious order, nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. I was a very, very, very good drunk. Nobody realized whether I had one drink or whether I had 20 drinks. I still presented the same way. And that's the baffling thing about alcohol. And it's the devious thing about alcohol is that no alcoholic, no two alcoholics are exactly the same. So, you know, eventually it came to the stage that what we ate, what we bought in the supermarket, what I bought around town was all dependent on alcohol. I loved casseroles because you could get a casserole ready in the morning, chop everything up, stick it in the oven for, on a nice low heat, because just in case it burnt, for three and a half, for three and a half hours, and for three and a half hours I was free, I could go downtown, drink as much as I want, come back, dinner was ready, wife arrive in, kid come back from school, everything was perfect. What could you complain about? The fire was lit, the house was tidy, the table was set, the dinner was ready. What's the problem here? And so that's what I kept doing. But I knew in my heart and soul that what was happening was wrong. I was brought up to know the difference between right and wrong. And I knew what was happening was not good. So 
So on this side, I had this person who wanted to drink more and more and more, and this other person who wanted to be the perfect father, the perfect parent, the perfect next-door neighbor. And that stretch, just one day, became too much. And it was on a Friday. And I went downtown, I had a few drinks, just a couple, and I came back and I just put my hands on the counter. I was on my own, there was nobody else in the house. And I said, I cannot do this anymore. I cannot continue on leading this double life. You know, I used to be the first person up in the morning. But I used to be the first person up in the morning who was puking in the shower, trying to get the shower. Fucking stuff down the, down the, down the plug hole. You're trying to get puked on a trip, down the plug hole with your foot. It's quite difficult. And, you know, and I was the only person in the house that was dry reaching in the towel as they were trying to dry, as they were trying to shave themselves. So alcohol had finally got its grip of me. But this Friday I came in and I said, this has to stop. So I rang a buddy of mine in AA. He thought I was drunk. I rang my G, I rang my GP and he was convinced I was drunk. Um, I rang a treatment center to see if they could, te- if they could take me. And they said, yes, they could take me the following day. So my wife came in from school and I had all this great news to tell her. Hey, I'm going to get fixed. And, um, she didn't believe me. So she made the same phone calls. GP, the friend in AA, and the treatment center. And she couldn't believe it because, God help her, she actually didn't realize how much I was drinking. My drinking was so sneaky and so contrived and so meticulously planned that she didn't understand how much I was actually drinking. She knew I was a heavy drinker, but she didn't understand exactly how much drink had mentally fried my brain. So I went to a treatment center, and thanks be to God, I have not had a drink since. Touch wood. What happened in the treatment center was very simple. I didn't have to detox. In fact, it took me three days to convince them that I was an alcoholic. Because I didn't present with the shakes. I could sleep. I could eat. I could hold a rational conversation just like I am now. I, I went into the treatment center just the way I am now. So they, they were totally confused by me. But eventually the penny dropped with them, thanks be to God. That as I ex- explained what I was doing over a period of time, they began to understu- understu- understand how bad an alcoholic I was. And believe you me, I was bad. There is no day in sobriety that can possibly be as bad as a day of drink. There is no, not one day of sobriety. Nothing has come to pass in, since I put down a glass on the 28th of March 2008, nothing has happened to me or my family that we can't deal with. And that's because of one thing, and that's faith. I have faith in a higher power. Now, I lived as a monk for 10 years. You would have thought that some sort of spirituality might have rubbed off on me. (laughs) Well, the simple fact is, maybe I wasn't listening properly, but it didn't. It was only when I came into AA that the spirituality, the spirituality that there is in this program began to make sense. All of a sudden, things began to work out. Simple things. Um, going home, being able to go home and not drink from the treatment center for a couple of days and then go back and report, yeah, that went okay. I was now allowed mind my son when my wife would go out, you know, if she went out shopping or went out to get her hair done or something like that, I could be relied upon to be the same 
when she came back that I wouldn't be under any influence of any uh, drink or drug. The treatment centre also told me and taught me, and this is the real one, this was the clincher for me, was that I was ruining other people's lives. That what I was doing was as bad as the car crash that I had been in. There was victims from my alcoholism. My victims were my wife and my, and my son, who was about six years of age at that stage. Because I couldn't be left with them. If my wife went off somewhere for a night, um, it invariably led to me passing out unconscious on the couch later on that night. I was waking up with all the lights on, television still on, fire gone out. Um, I kind of stumble up the stairs and go to bed. You know, that's the type of father that I was when I was drinking. Thank God that is not the situation today. Today I can honestly stand up here and say step one is the only step that I have done perfectly up to today. And that's because I've got a faith. Now I don't care whether you want to have faith in a Buddha, an Allah, a Jesus Christ, the leg of the chair, that water bottle, the sunshine, the AA group that you're in. But for the new people, for the newcomers, find a faith in something outside of yourself. Because it will make your recovery all the more remarkable. The adventure of the 12 steps is a marvelous journey to go on. It opened, I was very fortunate that with my first um, sponsor, who has since unfortunately died, it was actually a lady, and she brought me on the adventure of the 12 steps. I rang her twice a day, every day, and I saw her at least twice a week for my for the first two years. And all I can say is that this was an adventure. It really was. Suddenly, I could actually begin to be myself. Something that I had tried not to be for 30 odd years. And the steps and the program all made sense to me. And this is where, you know, it says, Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake. I am a cast iron believer in that. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake. The things that happened to me when I was young, when I joined uh, the religious order, the crash that I was in, it was all leading to this point where I could surrender and say, stop. This has to stop. The problem that I had with that, and one of the biggest fears that I had, was that I wasn't a daily drinker. But I was a daily thinker about alcohol. And the biggest fear that I had was that I, 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 know, I knew I could stop but I didn't know how to stay stopped. That was, the, that was the big conundrum. And stay stopped happily. I didn't want to be a grumpy old man. I didn't want to be a crusty old fart sitting in a corner, you know, somewhere that nobody really kind of wanted, wanted to talk to. And the adventures of the 12 steps and my first sponsor, that's what opened my eyes to the world of AA. The world of AA to me is now my world. It is the only world that I want to live in. It is the only place that I feel totally at home. 
I'm in a room, I'm not, not eight, eight odd thousand miles away from home, from in a room with perfect strangers, and yet I feel totally at home. In what other organization can that happen? I don't know of any. And that is the miracle of AA. I can walk into a room, no matter where I am, and I'll always feel welcomed, I'll feel at home, and I'll feel as if I am part of the furniture. And that's the miracle of the 12 steps. For the newcomers especially, I beg you to stay around, talk to alcoholics, listen to alcoholics, have coffee with alcoholics, get a ride home with alcoholics. The more time you spend with alcoholics, the better you are going to get. It is as simple as that. I love alcoholics. I absolutely love them because we speak the same language. Civilians out there. <laughs> they don't. It's, it, 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 it's a fact. It's a fact. It's a fact. If my wife was sitting here now, she'd be scratching her head saying, what? She wouldn't understand. But I know that you all know. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. Because some people have gone through the steps. Some people are starting the steps. Some people are redoing them again. And we've got people that have sobriety from God knows how many years to down, maybe down to just 30 or 60 or 90 days. But it still works. If you want this thing badly enough, it's there for you. And it will give you a life that is just way out there. Way out there. You know? Here, as I said, I, 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 I'm eight and a half thousand miles or something away from home and I don't give a damn. I'm in, I'm in an AA room. My wife doesn't give a damn that I'm eight and a half thousand miles away from home because I'm in an AA room. She understands that much. She understands the power of AA and the power of the adventures of those 12 steps. I'm not saying they're easy. They're not. If they were easy, everybody would be doing it. Right? That's, it, it, that, that is a fact. If, if, if this was easy, There'd be millions. I, I'd be in whatever park there is downtown in, um, Jesus, where am I? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there would be tens of thousands of people listening. We are the lucky ones. You must understand that. Whether you're in day one or day gazillion, we are the lucky ones. And with that luck comes responsibility. There is no point getting this program, wrapping it all up, and saying, right, that's mine. Right? That will not keep you sober in my experience and in my opinion. We have to share this thing. We have it. We've got it. It's the best thing we have ever got. It's the best thing that's ever been given to me in my life. I didn't ask for it, and I certainly didn't deserve it. But now that I have it, I want to share it, and I want to give it away, and I want to keep giving it away, and I want to keep giving it away so that somebody else who was in the same crap that I was in can benefit from it. And can have a fruitful, happy, good, productive life. Instead of swigging out of a bottle of whiskey or a few beers or a few cans or tins or whatever you call them over here. <laughs> you know? So I would plead, I would plead with you, I would beg you, find faith in something. Say your prayers every morning. I don't go down on my knees, I'm not going to lie, because I wouldn't be able to get back up again. 
Um, but I do say my prayers in the morning. I say an Our Father, and I say a, uh, the Serenity Prayer. That's as soon as I wake up in the morning and I remember. Because I can honestly say in all the days that since I've stopped drinking, I still get a kick out of waking up without a hangover. Jesus, it's a great feeling. Excuse me, sorry. It's, 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 it's a great feeling. It really is. To know that I, I, I haven't got the thing of, oh, what did I do? Where did I, and did I really say that? I haven't got that today. All I've got to do today is just go to bed and go to sleep and wake up again. It's as simple as that. And wake up happy and wake up that it's another day. It's another sober day. So please, please find faith in something or someone or any anything that you have that will assist you in that process because that is the kernel of the 12 steps and the 12 traditions. And it's the kernel, in my experience, of what makes AA great. And believe you me, there is no organization, as far as I am concerned, in the world like AA. It is life-saving. It's life-saving for me. It's life-saving for you. And hopefully it's life-saving for the people that you're going to meet when you go to 12-step them, or people who talk to you about alcohol, just sow a little seed in their head. Just sow a small seed in their head, and who's to know that they won't walk through that door? That's all you're asked to do. It's all that we have to do as alcoholics. Find a faith, be responsible, stick to the program, and mix with other alcoholics it's not it's not undoable it's more than doable all you have to do is look around the room and I'm sure there's people here with 20, 30, 40 years of sobriety and I take my hat off to them it's fantastic and as I said it is an adventure things you know what am I doing here I'm over 8,000 miles away from home and yet I'm here you know I'm here because my higher power wants me to be here. And I've accepted that. And once I accept that, then everything else falls into place. It's when my ego or my lack of humility puts me in the middle that everything kind of goes a bit pear-shaped. It goes a bit wrong. So to finish up, all I'll ask you is find a God. Find a faith. Find someone or something that will keep you in that in that realm of things so that you can stay stopped. You don't have to live in fear. You can have a happy and fulfilled life. You can go out there and dream. And dreams can come true. And that's the power of those 12 steps. It's nothing to do with me. It's nothing to do with me at all. It's to do with those 12 steps and you people that are sitting down there on your backsides. Don't come to me afterwards and say, oh, I'm stuck on this or I'm stuck on that or I don't like this or the coffee isn't hot enough or the fucking... I don't know. Get a life. <laughs> you know? You know, like that. that's what the 12 steps are about. We have to practice these principles in all our affairs. And if we try and do that, my God isn't out there trying to trip me up or catch me out. I've got a benevolent God in my life. He's a loving God. He's helping me along. And he's putting his arm around his shoulder, on my shoulder, to help me along. He's not trying to catch me out. And if you can get that picture in your mind, all will be well. All will be well. You will have the gifts of the 12 steps, the gifts of fellowship, the gift of sobriety, and most of all, the gift of each other, and being able to share with each other what's important. 
in your life. That's it. That's it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.